development plants, construction, or facilities related to recreational vehicle, RV parks, for land within the city of Rockport, providing a savings clause, providing a severability clause, finding and determining that the meeting at which the ordinance was passed was open to the public as required by law, and providing an effective date. This one, um, Ms. Torres, is this you? Yes, sir. Um, there is no changes to No changes to form or, or um, substance to this? So move. Second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call vote. Board one. I go sleep. Mr. Saski, are you out there? Ward one. I've asked him to unmute. Michael, are you there? Ward two. Aye. Ward three. Aye. Ward four. Aye. Mayor, aye. Going back to Ward one. We have four and one no vote. Item 15. Text. Okay. I'm 15. Here and deliberate on draft amendments to code of ordinances, chapter 18, zoning concerning recreational vehicle parks. Ms. Torres. Hello. Mary, not the long time to see you, right? <laughs> so, just to give you some background on this item, as you know, the city of Rockford has recently become popular for RV park development. So, particularly along the bypass. So, back in July of 2018, staff recommended a moratorium be set so that way that would give us time to evaluate what kind of regulations we have in place um, and where these types of developments would best fit in our community. So, since then, we've brought on our urban planning consultant, Bryce Fox of Urban Dynamics, to so provide us some graphic amendments that would strengthen city policies regarding our community parks. So we work very closely with the city staff. We also met with the planning zoning commission early in March. And so tonight we're presenting a draft of those ordinance amendments for us to go on together and discuss um, these items. So with that, I will turn it over to Bryce for all the details. He did have a presentation as well. Good evening, City Council. Um, I hope that everybody can hear me well and I'm coming through perfect. Yes, sir. All right. Well, good evening. Uh, good evening, Planning and Zoning Commission. I believe they're with us as well still, hopefully, uh, as well as everyone else who's uh, attending the meeting who's interested in this item. Um, just starting off a little bit, uh, as, as Amanda had said, um, I'm with, I'm the president of Urban Dynamics LLC. We're a, a small consulting, a planning consulting firm that specializes in development support for small and mid-sized Texas cities uh, across the state. We have a general philosophy that we like to keep all of our solutions practical, simple, and dynamic. Um, in, our, in an ever-changing world, it's very important that, that solutions for cities meet your needs and in a way that can be enforced with the resources that you have. Um, we also believe in creating the most opportunity for the most people. Ready for the next slide. Perfect. So, um, and, I, and I want to start off here with, with complimenting your staff. You have a really wonderful development staff uh, who is very knowledgeable and very sharp on their game. So, uh, kudos to them, and, and, and I hope that they uh, get their due credit all the time because they really deserve it. Um, so, uh, as, as Amanda said, I got brought on and to uh, draft a update for RV parks due to the moratorium. And so, kind of within this project scope, is, is creating uh, a new zoning district, which will cater to RV parks as well as some related land uses um, that we'll go through here in just a bit, as well as identifying and updating um, special design regulations for that new district, <laughs> uh, 
uh, within the context of RV parks and land. Um, additionally, we needed to incorporate all of these changes Hit into the your city. existing zoning ordinance in the same style that it's already written. Um, as well as updating other sections of the city's code to ensure consistency and making sure that there's not um, any overlapping pieces that are left over in the code or anything um, that would, would be counter to, to each piece. So, so far to date, um, we've had, we started off having several meetings with staff. Um, I think we've had three or four on RV parks, uh, just to go over community concerns, staff concerns, a number of possibilities um, and, and possible solutions to really figure out uh, and narrow the, narrow the real scope to, to get exactly what the community needs, hopefully. Um, we then workshopped on March 1st with the Planning and Zoning Commission um, at a very high level, just in, uh, some ideas and some uh, general approaches to this process uh, to get some input, to get an understanding, making sure that, that we're going down the right path and, and everything's looking good. Uh, we then drafted that ordinance, um, the update itself, uh, which I believe is, is in your packet and, and hopefully everyone's had a chance to review. Uh, and staff has, has reviewed it and given some comments back and we've corrected those things. I, I did catch a typo, so I, I, will, <laughs> I will correct it. And again, this is the draft. We're not finished with everything yet. Uh, and then finally, we're, we're here tonight at City Council to talk through uh, a number of the changes as well as get general input of this is what you're looking for. Uh, are we off mark? It is right in the wheelhouse of what, what everyone's uh, looking for, what the community needs. So with that, I'll hop right in. So one of the very first things that this the city. ordinance does Use is, the city. Um, as everyone most likely knows, right now recreational vehicle parks are a specific use permit within the city. And they're actually written synonymously with manufacturing owned communities. Um, in the city, these serve two very different purposes. And so the very first thing that we did is we split that piece off. So manufactured home community still exists and is proposed to exist as a specific use permit. Um, in addition to, I believe, a, a by right in um, the R2M district. And then RV parks now named land use and permitted in by right in a brand new district, uh, which is for RV parks, which is R8, which we're proposing. Um, so in addition to this removal of the of the SUP process for RV parks, which now allows, um, it, it won't allow RV parks in every zoning district, it'll be required to be in this new R8 district and city council will at some point need to uh, rezone whether um, by uh, initiation of the city council or through um, independent landowners requesting this zoning. Um, that new district in order for these rules to take effect fully, um, assuming it's also adopted. And so one of the first pieces that we did was identify a number of land the uses, damn uh, in addition to RV parks that would be appropriate uh, for a number of areas where you would have an RV park as an acceptable land use um, so that we're not kind of pigeonholing everything into uh, one district with one use and that's the only thing that can ever be there. And so a couple of the uses, just to name a few that are also being proposed to be permitted by right are restaurants, cafes, and food catering services, uh, office banks, libraries, museums, um, shops, bed and breakfast, uh, re religious educational and philanthropic institutions, public parks and public buildings with the exception of detention centers and penal and mental institutions as well as golf courses and golf clubs, but not commercial miniature golf or driving ranges. Um, and so in addition to those general primary uses, we've also identified a number of accessory uses specifically for RV parks to include temporary boat and trailer parking. Uh, you know, the idea there is to have a space for uh, visitors to who, you know, bring their boats, uh, and maybe have an additional trailer or, or um, haul around that they're doing to have a place to park those. Uh, campgrounds as well. Um, and then park manager living quarters. So especially at a lot, some of the larger RV parks, you, uh, a lot of times the park manager will be living on site uh, seasonally or possibly year round. So it's important to kind of capture that. Uh, as well as the ability to have RV parks that have RVs that are for rent uh, instead of just slips 
and uh, the limited use of cabins for rentals as well. And again, all of this would be permitted by right. Uh, these four uses would be accessory to an RV park, so an RV park would have to be <laughs> primary use first before these uh, would be allowed. Uh, the next big thing that it does is it does uh, establish a minimum RV space size of 40 by 60. Uh, and this includes also a second piece to it, which is minimum setbacks between RV spaces, or sorry, RV spaces, but between the physical RV on the space um, due to both kind of some breathing room as well as life safety um, from fire transmission, emergency service access, access perspectives. Um, and so those proposed distances are 20 feet side to side, um, as well as 20 feet end to end. Um, additionally, a, a reduced setback of 10 feet between units and um, uh, physical structures is also included there for that same reason. Um, and I, I got an, uh, an email from uh, Kevin earlier today that had a comment in it asking about the RV space size and why it's proposed at 46, 40 by 60, um, and that that was a little bit larger than I'm sure a number of uh, RV parks within the city already. And the rationale for that as we worked through this uh, with staff is it, the 40 feet by 60 feet encompasses both the 20 foot side to side and 20 foot end to end spacing. And so on that 40 foot width, basically we're already down to, um, you know, 20 feet of it is either you're splitting the difference on each side of the RV with 10 feet or you're um, side loading all of them. So they're all, let's say, on the right side of the slip and that 20 foot space is on the left. Uh, that 20 foot space also serves or can serve as um, some open space and recreational space for that individual slip. A lot of times we see picnic tables or things like that. And it can also help with parking, um, which has been identified as a problem um, throughout a number of RV parks um, that we've tried to, to rectify here as well. As far as the 60 feet, and so that's right, that leaves you 20 feet of space for an RV. Um, RVs, when they travel, the maximum size that they're supposed to be is eight and a half feet wide when they're driving down the road uh, by, uh, let me see here, I believe 40 Dex feet Dex roughly Dex in, in uh, length for the bigger ones. And as everybody probably knows, especially with modern RVs, when you then park them with the slide outs, um, which can occur on multiple sides as well as front and back and uh, awnings, which can extend six to eight feet as well. You're really looking at a footprint, uh, kind of a maximum footprint of the biggest RVs at about 19 and a half to 20 feet wide by anywhere from 48 to 51 feet deep. And so there is a little bit of wiggle room, maybe a foot or two it kind of across the board between front and back and side to side. Um, against maintaining these life safety men, um, life safety spaces and allowing for that maximum RV size. size. And the rationale behind that is, as everybody probably can guess, RVs continuously get bigger. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what the next rendition is. I kind of have a running joke that I think there's going to be a two-story RV at some point in time that has a vertical pop-up as well. And we'll just kind of see how that one ends up playing out. Um, but, you know, in, in order to kind of future proof a little bit it gives us a little bit of wiggle room but it also we have to recognize that a lot of RVers are not professional vehicle operators that that drive trailers day in and day out as a profession so they may not be the best at parking things like that this little bit of wiggle room of a foot or so also helps a little bit with that and so that spaces and 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 new RV parks that would build underneath these requirements are able to um, have that little bit of wiggle room. And so you're not having to constantly send code enforcement out or the fire department out to cite people for um, missing the setbacks or things being too close, right? We want to give a little bit more space. We want to add in that just a little bit of wiggle room so we can keep everybody honest through the process. Uh, so in addition to all of those setbacks, if that kind of makes sense, is we're now to about, you know, 50 feet more or less with, with, punch outs front and back on these items and with that 60 foot maximum uh, or minimum depth that gives you 10 feet on each slip to uh, make up for that 20 foot separation end to end we also looked at um, creating minimums for interior access drives and this is in order because one of the items that was identified was that um, in a lot of in a lot of the uh, RV park, existing RV parks um, throughout both the city and the county, 
Uh, they have very small drive aisles that oftentimes people are parking in, even if they're not supposed to. Uh, and it does cause impediments for life safety to get there for, you know, emergency services to send EMS or, you know, hopefully no fires, but it does happen time to time uh, for the fire trucks to get out there and for everybody to have clear access. Um, and so we have, we have put in minimum access drives. Uh, the smallest drive width is uh, 24 feet. So give me just a second let me get down to that is 24 feet uh, and that does not allow for parking on either side but that does allow for two-way traffic um, the other thing to think about is we kind of just talked about was the, that not everyone's a super great driver so a little bit more room and width in the roadways is always a good thing um, and ultimately should help out the rv parks uh, as well and so the uh, first piece again is that 24 foot uh, drive access the other options that in, are included in here um, slowly increase the access drives um, in in depth, or sorry, in width from 24 feet to 30 feet for parking on one side of the drive aisle, but not the other, uh, and that's parallel parking. And then 36 feet of width for uh, parking on both sides. And again, that allows for about a 22 foot uh, travel lane at that point in time for two-way traffic to pass by, assuming an eight-foot parallel parking width. Uh, but does it, you, you will see in, in the uh, proposed ordinance that piece under parking. It also establishes the parking requirement of two spaces uh, per RV slip. And this is kind of important to, to hammer out two pieces, one of which is going to be visitors that join the park, but also um, a lot of RVs these days are hauled by, especially fifth wheels, are hauled by uh, big, large trucks and then have a lot of times they'll even haul a smaller vehicle as well. So it's not unrealistic to end up with two vehicles on site per slip as a requirement anyways. Uh, and so we just need to make sure that we're parking for those. Again, keep, keep people from needing to park in places they shouldn't, such as fire lanes um, or life safety areas. Next, it establishes a minimum open space uh, requirement of 20%. Um, this is in addition to a requirement of 8% for that uh, amenities area. Um, if, they, if that amenities area is decided to be um, you know, all open space or programmed as playgrounds and, and, and outdoor uh, amenity, that can absolutely count towards that 20%. Um, as can the green space where you don't have the actual RV pad in each of these slips. So, you know, our, our hope is that nobody's going to be trying to pour 40 by 60 concrete slabs uh, for these slips, but instead just pour what is needed for the RV and then leave the other areas grass, um, you know, and vegetative surface to help with both drainage as well as, you know, beautify the area and not create those big concrete jungles. And so this 20% open space requirement is, is hopefully to allow for that, but also allow for flexibility and design since a lot of sites are going to be unique and each site's a little different. Next, it really bumps up the screening and buffering. We had heard that, um, I heard from staff that this was a big issue, um, that the, the desire of the community was for them to be um, new RV parks to be much nicer and the easiest way to do that is to regulate kind of what's seen from the right of way, um, as well as buffering against existing um, residential or residentially zoned property. And so one of the requirements that's proposed in here is a solid screening wall um, between the right of way and the RV park, as well as between any adjacently uh, zoned residential property and the RV park. Um, in addition to that solid screening wall um, along the right of way, there's a requirement for 15 foot landscape buffer. So we've increased uh, that buffer just a bit. Uh, that's then planted with trees and living landscaping. Um, you currently already have a requirement for a number of landscaping pieces. Um, this deeper buffer will also help enhance that, uh, those existing requirements. Also, we provided for alternative compliance for existing dense natural vegetation. Um, this was a really important piece. Uh, you know, we've, we definitely heard about it in the last couple of public hearings about the really unique um, nature and ecosystems that exist in Rockport and in the surrounding areas. And so absolutely we want to reward and not um, try to penalize people who want to preserve 
the natural vegetation, especially if they have, you know, gorgeous trees and dense vegetation. And so we've provided this alternative compliance piece um, in order so that you don't, we're not forcing people to clear cut areas, but we're giving them an opportunity to say, yeah, let's really preserve this stuff. And if you do it, and it basically serves that same purpose of screening, then you have much lower standard that you have to meet um, along those areas. Next slide. So, um, you know, kind of with that, that's an, a, a big overview. And I'd love to hear from, uh, you know, council and from, from planning and zoning commission, what do you like about this uh, proposal? What do you think needs improvement? What concerns do you have? Or have you heard from the community that aren't being addressed in here? Um, you know, and, and with that, I'm, I'm happy to field any questions or comments that anyone has. Oh, sorry, I have one other item. I apologize. Um, there was also a concern about who does this, uh, who would this new ordinance apply to? And uh, the easiest answer on that as proposed would be any new recreational vehicle park that was interested in coming in the city would need to request this rezoning um, and it would apply to them. All of your existing RV parks that are existing non-conforming um, or have specific use permits under the current rules would continue to be existing non-conforming um, and those of the SUPs would now become um, existing non-conforming and would be governed by that existing SUP. Um, a lot of times what that means is based on your ordinance, you're allowed to continue to do what you're doing today. You just can't expand, which I think is um, the same challenge that a lot of those places have had um, already with going back through the SUP process for expansion or being a non-conforming use that was annexed into the city like this um, and then trying to expand as well. And so this would really apply to those new expansions as well as um, anything that was brand new uh, as an RV park. Council, questions, comments? Um, only thing I mean, it's a great presentation. In fact, I listened to uh, Mr. Cox speak at their uh, zoning um, meeting uh, not too long ago. Um, but I said there before, I, I, and we have seen the way I voted in the past is I, I'm just not a fan of RV parks, period. I just, I think we have too many of them already and I, I think that we just don't need them anymore in the city. Um, and if anything, try to keep them out into the county. Uh, but that's just my opinion. Who's that? Who's that? Who that said that? Since you brought up the uh, grandfathering issue at the end, that's what I've been hearing from the RV parks in my ward. And this, the ordinance itself does not ward, say my ward. grandfathering would work. And my the ward. general Who's ordinance my ward? for grandfathering really is oriented at structures. So that if you know a certain percent of a structure is destroyed, then that triggers a you know new application of the new um, zoning, and that doesn't make much sense in an RV context where you could destroy every RV that happens to be in the park, but you still have the infrastructure, you still have the pads. Exactly. You know, even if you wreck the guy? building that's My the work. office, the park itself is not really affected in the way that a normal uh, structure would be for other kinds of zoning. So I'd suggest either including a specific grandfathering uh, arrangement in the R8 uh, rules or making some accommodation in the general uh, grandfathering ordinance in order to deal with the special case of RV parks. I like it. I like it. We just did Who one is this guy? Too, right? With one that was, um, was trying to expand, correct? Uh-oh. Um, yeah, we did the, uh, mm -hmm. out on the bypass. Oh. I, I will also note um, in, the, in the session that's covering non uses is mentioned, this is the thing that you still look at the RV parks still functioning. Right. Then I would say it comes in that part. And, and all the folks I've talked to agree that, you know, if they go out of the RV business and they're using that property for something else, yeah. then that would be a triggering event. and. If you wanted to reuse it, uh, you come back for 
a new use of it as an RV park, then you'd be under the new yeah. uh, regime. Right. And, right. of course, I guess the regime is set up so unless that area, when it stops RV use, becomes zoned for R8, you know, yep. uh, is that how we intend yep. to do it, is to go through yep. now and say, yep. okay, areas where there are RV parks already, we're now going to designate R8, no. but within that R8 area, you are grandfathered if you have pre-existing uses that are non-conforming? So, so I would say we would apply to, um, so that is a unique scenario. If, if an RV park is zoned for that particular use, then Because a lot of the existing parks aren't going to come anywhere near four acres exactly. uh, to qualify right. under R8 in the first place. Well, um, that's already a minimum requirement within the current regulations. Oh, is it? Yes, sir. Well, it doesn't matter. They, four acres must be smaller than I have in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think some of the parks in my ward may pre-exist the zoning code Who's itself. my ward? Gosh. I'll point out, too, that uh, we did put in provisions that spells out addressing, Yes, you know, which is a, an ongoing issue with emergency vehicles uh, on responding. Um, so that, that's spelled out so that uh, is improved going forward. Yeah, that's uh, fair, fair. our dispatchers and first responders would appreciate that. So, was there any effort to see whether these rules are actually economically feasible in our area? Did we do any comparison with existing parks that have a similar kind of, of uh, structure and whether they, you know, can make money on this with these kinds of regulations? Mm, true, true. Good answer. Now, who's Ward? I, I believe our we were going, um, I don't know this. Ah. We were considering economics. Ah, there you go. You weren't considering. Citizen about RV parks and how they're designed, how they are supposed to be used, and how they are supposed to be Yeah, you were looking for everything, but if they're going to make a profit. You want to kill your economy. Get rid of all of them, right? Who are you? Ah. She's a dumbass. Who the hell is she? So, I mean, it, it sounds as though it's being driven Thank you. by the largest Thank you. RVs. Yes. And Thank you. some expectation they'll get even larger. And yep. the giant vehicles that are used to haul those and not the standard RV that a lot of folks come down in the winter driving and staying here i just wonder how we can accommodate i, I think this, there's an accommodation. Yeah, i think this is an improvement from a size perspective on on just a regular rv i mean those like the comment he made i i've watched people try to back them into driveways and service them around town and and move them around uh, i don't know how they get them into those parks i know people that will not go to an rv park unless they can pull through because okay. they can't back them up so i think this would help uh, from that perspective, you might have it might be an economic boon to a developer if he's got one that's got room. I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to go bend an eighty thousand dollar fifth wheel when I've got the opportunity to pay a little bit more a night and and just pull it in easily. Well, that was kind of that was kind of where my comment was going is that it all seems oriented at the eighty thousand dollar fifth wheel yep. without an alternative yep. for RV parks that cater to smaller RVs and therefore, you know, a lot of this yep. is overkill. Yep. It's a one size yep. fits all yep. devoted toward yep. the idea Who is this guy? of encouraging He's good, but he doesn't talk. and expecting large RVs uh, and therefore at a price point that's yes. going to hit a single about, economic group and rule out other economic yeah. groups. But, but to JD's point, we have an overabundance of the smaller RV parks that can cater to those smaller RVs. Who is this guy? Well, who's this guy? Uh, I, I guess. I guess then, what I'm pointing out is that Rockport is deciding that if we went in this direction, we would be looking to high-end RV parks 
as the norm and let the county go for, you know, uh, resources for everyone else. Well, we shouldn't limit small armies to be placed there. I mean, right. whether or not that particular property or the army park owner agrees, or there are reasons to be placed there, that's their prerogative. Right. But well, what is this fucking idiot, lady? Shouldn't you know what the fuck you're talking about? Spaces, uh, whenever, when I'm looking at Concan, um, and we're looking at cabins and stuff, and you'll see how they advertise pull-in slits, you know, for for the yeah. uh, all those RVs, and and there's all different size ones there too. I mean, and I I, when, when being there, and you see those huge ones come in, you just don't know how they can do it. I, I, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, I've seen some mobile homes being put into spaces I couldn't believe a mobile home would fit either. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just you're right that you can put a smaller trailer onto these big lots, but the owner Economics. of the RV park is going to have to charge something yep. based on the number of lots he has to cover available. taxes. And so the the people who have smaller trailers because they have less money and can't afford an eighty thousand or hundred thousand dollar trailer are going to get you know ruled out. Who's this guy? He's smart. They have to pay for rental yeah, in a park I, that's devoted I to I disagree with that. Most airstreams there are about $100,000 in their bumper pool. Come on, you found one exception, dude. That's, that's 5%. Oh, well, yeah, that's, that's my point. Yeah. But airstream are. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, but, but that's my point. But that by designing, by, by requiring a design that is such a big lot, therefore the owner of the property has to charge a certain amount to get his investment back. Then whether you you know you've got a small or a big trailer, you're still having to pay the higher amount because the property owner can only charge for so many lots, right? Yep. You know, the the RV park is what you know, you build a lot of new parks, and people are going to come to the parking spaces, and they're going to pay your fees. Oh, they're going to come and pay your fees. You know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to establish an ordinance by which we take control of the type of parks that are developed within our community. And so we don't not discount what's already here, but we put the standards in place because of the concerns we've had from multiple citizens in our community about the numbers and the locations of our RV parks. So we have raised the bar, if you will, on what we expect when people develop and come in here. We have provisions in there to look at whether or not they need or should be required to hook to city utilities. That's another huge thing that could increase the cost for development and everything else. And again, you know, the ones that are going to keep those standards and come in are going to be you know, quality parks. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times we've had people come in here and they say, I want to talk to you about developing a high end, high quality RV park. And then when they make the presentation to us, their idea of high quality and high end is considerably different than what other people's and perception of what high quality and high end. Well, I mean, I think that you've answered exactly the question or the point that I was making that we are intentionally creating an RV program that is that is oriented to that higher end and therefore not to a medium end uh, most likely. I mean, it's possible you could pull in with a smaller RV, but typically people who own those own the smaller ones because they can't afford the larger ones and the cost of being in a bigger in a park that meets these requirements will be higher than other kinds so of you're parks. You're trying to right? run out the trash, yeah, but you let them file I'm eviction. Not, I'm making an argument about they don't it. Have to I'm pay just rent. Asking if that's what we're doing. No, you're not. You're, you're contradicting well, yourself, dude. It's, that's it's called hypocr hypocrisy. How you want these RV park want regulations? Trash out. Like, Lower income people, you know, huh? There you go, woman. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's just a consideration to take mine, so. Well, 
you look at it from, from a market response standpoint, right now, before we did the moratorium, they are popping up all over the place. You know, we were getting them, one time we had five or six proposals uh, at one time. Uh, if we implement this uh, proposed, these proposed changes and the market crashes, we don't get any, then we know we've, we've stretched too far. But uh, I suspect that even with these changes, that we will still have a strong demand. It may be a different mix of uh, RVers, but we will have a strong demand. It will be a better quality development, which is what we need. I think some of the changes, particularly when it comes to utilities, extension of utilities, that will help everybody, right. not just RVers. But you know, when COVID hit, there was an abundance of RVs purchased. That's how everyone was their way of traveling. So, I mean, obviously, when, when if this ever ends, people are going to be selling them to other people to try to get rid of them. And they're still going to be traveling, you know, with those RVs. So, I, I mean, I don't think it's going to, I don't think it will crash, but I think they'll just be. There we go again. Feet. One there, ten percent of the vehicles. That's the mayor. The mayor. Johnson, now I blew up the speaker. The mayor's the uh, one who's the that's asshole. That's a high end. I, I see this as nothing but from a, mayor. A, a bonus for us. I mean, right now, we, we, you, you can't look me at these. And me and mayor are going to have a little exactly talk on right. Tuesday. These things are going to be twist, tweaked at some point. They're going to be looked at. Uh, we'll know if people look at this. At Dude, you don't have a chance to go backwards. They don't want to develop RV parks here. Uh, and, and if they don't want, if they don't want or can't develop to these standards inside the city limits of Rockport, they will step over the line and develop in the unincorporated part of right. the county. They'll go to Rans's Pass or yeah. And when, when we when we entered this moratorium, or at least when I first started, why would you want uh, him to go to Rans's Pass? I had a real concern that post hurricane we had recognized this that old a lot guy of the, with the white shirt? workforce that. I can't take a picture in of our recording. core businesses uh, lived in RV situations, and so it was an important aspect of our workforce housing. Since then, there's been so much proliferation in the county that I really don't have that as a particular concern that Rockport has to fill the gap when RV parks have proliferated in the county so much. And I don't have really have any issue with the safety programs of having roads that are big enough for Ooh, like this guy. Uh, emergency vehicles, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Some sort of separation between structures so that when one RV catches fire, it doesn't burn up, you know, its neighbors. It'll burn that makes parts, perfect right? sense. Looking up to city wastewater and water, it makes a lot of sense. I'm really focusing more on the concept of lot, uh, of, of pad sizes that is designed to accommodate a particular big sized RV and whether without understanding what the economic world is for RV parks, whether we're, you know, expecting too much. I guess as Kevin says, we'll find out if nobody decides to have parks under these ordinances. Can I comment real quick on your workforce items? Um, just, I understand what you're coming from this point, but I would personally like to see the workforce that have families. They're more than just two people, and they shouldn't, I mean, they're working towards not living in RVs. They want to actually have homes and housing. And that's the thing that we need to focus on here in the city of Rockford. Not leaving them in RVs and building things for them. We need to start focusing on actually having homes or families in these workforce. You just blew off 110 homes you don't want either. Home set base. 
I only think that they're here wanting to keep living in RVs with five or six people and continue to do so. And, you know, where that's RV, you know, amendment here, we're looking at the city, we're not looking at it all around. And we have to look at what's best for the whole community, and we have to try to fit that into mold here somehow. So this was the first one, so I'm just going to say again, I think that we need to not keep focusing that on our park stance for them to be living in. That is something that we need to focus on trying to get actually homes and apartments and you know an actual living area for families here. We rebuilt the Peoria Park Workforce Housing, which is our park company. Uh, this is where David Smith and I are going to leave. Find a storm, and they're, they're coming back. And you make an excellent point. We've got, you know, employees of the city that were living in rental homes with, with the hurricane hit. And after the hurricane, the rental homes were no longer available to them. And the only alternative that they had to be able to stay in this community and continue to work here was to go purchase an RV and take it to a park. And they've been living there ever since, looking to see these apartment complexes and workforce housing come on board and then their intention is to try to sell the RV for the deposits necessary to move into one of the workforce housing projects that are being developed. So that, those are examples of the workforce housing. Now, unlike you, I'd rather see them in homes and or apartments to get them out of the RV. And the, the other problem is what I was told that, I guess the rentals, what's going on now is since the market is so hot, People are deciding to sell their rental to make money off of it um, and not, you know, so that the people that are living in it are having to go find other places to live. Uh, so, yeah, our rental market is starting slowly going down. Well, well this is not an action item, so. No. But it's. One more this morning, I'd like to ask. Um, I see the six foot fence and kind of there. Is there a reason why it's that height? Just because, you know, a lot of our to be a lot bigger. So why is it not an eight or a ten foot fence? Oh. Yes, we did. And that's just kind of in line with our current fencing That's regulations. Good. So it's just bigger, right? Yeah, it's like a rock board, right? That's that's a current height yeah. restriction. Yeah. Okay. We also talked about landscape buffering and screening and everything, depending on the location, especially on the bypass board. You know, we there are some areas that are going to be The RV Association involved. I'm going to kick her ass. Yeah. And, and all those people would come under the grandfather clause anyway. Meeting clowns. 
Well, if you ask me, I, I think we need to move forward because we've, we've been on the moratorium long enough. Okay. Go like through the process. That's what I would say is we start the process, go through it, take it to P&Z, contact the existing, you know, bring in the other folks, get everyone involved, and move forward. Talk to the RV Association, you clowns. I'll talk to you Tuesday about that. Any recommendations or questions? If you follow those through the city manager, get those back to us so we can give to Mr. Cox and uh, incorporate your ideas and or your questions to ensure that they're addressed. Economics, guys. You never did any homework. Recommendations, economics. The only only thing I would add is uh, it would be helpful to have some guidance from you all on how we Financially. start to address areas that would be zoned R8. It's one thing to have the ordinance, but until we have areas that actually are designated for R8, uh, it essentially works as a moratorium perpetually till we get that done. No. Wouldn't it? No. Just how we choose to address it. Who's this lady? I love you, Evelyn. I forgot everything I said back to you. You're awesome. Get me in this meeting. That's great. That's, yeah. a, that's exactly the kind yeah. of guidance I'd ask but, for but as the, you roll this out. But the, policy, I mean, the process would be the same right now. If someone was in an R, owned an R2 piece of property that would fit an uh, RV park, they would have to apply for R8 zoning. Would that be correct? Yeah. So, so, so we'd be looking at grassroots zoning. Yeah, then, we, so. wouldn't, we wouldn't go up there and arbitrarily say this part of town is R8. No, okay. I don't think that's what we want to do. Yeah, if it's you know, well, I mean, that's, that's how you do a ten-year plan, sir. Makes sense that this is a good way to evolve it. Well, everything's forward. everything's R one as it comes in. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's just a regular process. Yeah, we're not going to go out there and zone parts of town. That's R8. what we do. I agree with the mayor. that we just get the ball rolling? It's been too long. Uh oh. I agree, Vasi. You know, this is not a thing. So we want to give direction to uh, to the to staff to move forward, and bring something, put it together, and we'll take a look at it. I mean, again, all of this is always subject to tweaking and, and re- refining. Yeah, it's not going to be perfect for some of it. Even the stuff that's been on the books for years isn't perfect. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. I'd like to ask our consultant Price if he's got any other further comments to us after listening to our discussion. And maybe kind of close this out. Sure. Um, I, I think there's been a lot of great comments in here. Uh, definitely some things to look at. Um, as far, I guess, as far as, as guidance on on zoning R eight, um, you know, that's definitely something that we can we can look at as we go through this. I'm happy to work with staff to identify some of those areas to help out. I think um, Councilman Cunningham, what you're what you're getting at is is how do you then how does council then make that decision right and how do you do it in a way that you're not arbitrary and capricious in making that zoning decision and, um staff can absolutely help with that um and it may be something that staff can even work into the uh, draft comprehensive plan I, there's already some areas that that discuss rv parks uh, in your draft comprehensive plan and so that's another way that's a, a good outlet for that kind of answer um and then uh, yeah, I think overall it should be pretty easy to, to pull together um, and um, yeah, that I, I'm, I'm pretty clear on what I need to do on my side. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to work with the city. And like I said, you're, you've got a really smart staff. Uh, consider yourself really lucky. Oh, um, that's kind of a hard thing you to come by these days, especially with development. <laughs> so, um, and I just wanted to say that they've done a really great job. Puke. Um, Puke vetting through this process and working on this project. Pew, pew. Thank you. Uh, we done? I'm surprised, Mr. Mayor. I thought you were on our team. Obviously, that's strike two. <coughs> Get off your phone. Who's that lady on her phone? Get off her phone. Go to number 16 so I can... Go to bed.
Who's this lady? She's a dork. It's on mute, dudes. Unmute it. Great. Guys are, guys are awful at running a Zoom meeting. <coughs> We're on mute, guys, so they're still talking. <sighs> good way to not tell people what they're doing is keep it on mute. There's two people in their audience behind her. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, she points to the audience. There's two people. I don't know what she's saying. You kept it on the whole time the guy was trying to present his presentation. You turn it off when you're trying to finish the conversation. <laughs> oh, you guys are crazy. Gosh. I don't know. I'll give you another minute. Don't look like you guys figured it out. Just like you couldn't figure out the city was not on mute. And you kept talking and moving papers and stuff while the presenter was presenting. And it doesn't look like you guys know you're on mute again. All right. I'm giving you... 40 more seconds. Yeah, guys, while she's laughing, <laughs> you dumb. Oh, here we go. Yeah, really? Come on. Come on. Hey, you're, you're, you were muted. You're so, oh, I was muted. <laughs> so go back and talk about it again. Mike, uh, word one. Aye. Aye. Word two. Aye. Word three. Aye. Word four. Aye. Mayor. Aye. I should have muted myself there. <laughs> I don't know what okay. the last two Okay, item minutes. 17. Deliberate and act to authorize an interlocal agreement with the Coastal Planning Council.